everybody. Welcome to Square Off. Liz, Canada Post says if you're unable to get your mail from the community mailbox for health reasons, you need to provide a doctor's note. Mm -hmm. A doctor's note. I say keep the daily door-to-door -door service for everyone and stop nickel and diming the public. Really, Mark? Because I give full marks to Canada Post for working to change their business model with the times. And door-to-door -door delivery, well, just isn't practical. And the only people who really deserve it are those who can't get around. So getting a doctor's note to prove it, not a big deal. And we're going to talk about it later on Square Off. He is best known as the Prince of Pot. Vancouver resident Mark Emery spent five years in a U.S. prison for selling marijuana seeds through the mail. During his incarceration, supporters held protests and rallies demanding his release. This week, Emery was set free and re-entered Canada through Windsor, Ontario to be welcomed by a crowd of supporters and, you guessed it, clouds of pot smoke. Having been incarcerated for five years, this prince has some catching up to do. And Mark Emery joins us now from our studios at Queen's Park. Mark, if you're the prince of pot, does that mean you aspire to be the king of pot someday? I've said I'll be the king of cannabis when it's legal all in Canada and the United States. Uh, because then I'll have earned it. I'll have proven that I made a contribution to get marijuana legalized. And so then I shall ascend to the true throne when, <laughs> when we have legal pot. Mark, uh, can you live without pot? Did you have to give it up while you were in jail? Oh, pot was easy to overlook. I, I never thought about it in a, a consumption context. I wrote about marijuana legalization extensively in my blogs while in prison. I thought about the culture of cannabis, but I never at all craved uh, smoked cannabis, nor did I. And, and, ca and cannabis was always there in the prison. I could have got it at any time. But the punishments are so great as to be easily discouraging to someone like me. I didn't want to lose one but day wait a sec, wait a sec. You were, you were uh, selling seeds illegally across the border with the punishment of going to jail, and that didn't deter you. How could that have been worse punishment than, than being caught smoking pot in jail? Because I counted down every day the number of days left in my sentence from the day I got in there. And I prided myself on looking at that calendar and thinking only 1,200 days to go or 960 days to go. And it was painstaking, but I did not want to jeopardize one single day of that for just smoking marijuana. Remember, I went to jail for a principle, not, not the right to get high, mm. but the right to live a peaceful, honest lifestyle without going to jail or being punished. That's why I broke all those laws openly and transparently. I did that for a principle. But I don't have a need to get high. So you you weren't jonesing for a joint when you crossed the border into Windsor? At no time in my four and a half years. And what did you th and what did you think of people who were you know sort of blowing smoke in your direction, literally and figuratively, I guess, uh, and uh, celebrating your return? Well, that smelled like freedom, though. Um, I mean, it was an environment of welcoming someone back into the civilized you know uh, realm of of human behavior, and that smoke smelled like freedom to me. Uh, Mark, you know, uh, I was doing some research on you, and I didn't know you gave $5 million towards legalization yeah. of marijuana in Canada and the U.S. Yeah. A lot has happened in the, in the years that you've been gone. When you look out and you see that uh, Colorado and Washington State have legalized marijuana, uh, do you feel like you have played a big role in those changes? Well, I can definitely tell you that I gave money for, to gather the signatures that Colorado used to get medical marijuana on the ballot in the year 2000. So I directly contributed to that happening. And same with the ballot initiative in 1998 in Washington, D.C. I paid for the signature gathering campaign that occurred there, too. And we gave money to Arizona, Alaska. And now in Alaska, on three years, I gave them money to get something on the ballot. And now, this year, they're voting for legal marijuana. And it's going to get approved in Alaska, just like it will in Oregon and Washington, D.C., that place I gave money to. So I think my money has directly resulted in some long-term changes that are going to impact everyone in the world. Colorado and Washington are really interesting interesting models that everybody's studying, whether it's in other United States or in other countries around the world, about how the system of legalized marijuana mm -hmm. is going to work. Uh, when you found out that the state of Colorado uh, has uh, gotten over $12 million in taxes just off the sale of marijuana, and, that's, and we're only into, you know, August, uh, did, did you, at, at some point, did you say, wow, I didn't realize that the sale of uh, a recreational marijuana would be that beneficial to that state. Twelve million so far just in taxes. I, I got to believe it's actually much higher because the, the tax regime in, in Colorado is about 10 percent, I think. And in Washington, it's much higher. 
So I don't know how that's going to work. At some point, you can overtax and discourage people from using the open market if you tax it excessively. So these, these experiments we're seeing in the states are going to be very useful to determine where those optimum levels of taxation are before you don't get compliance from people, before they try and skirt the taxes. So these are terrific experiments, but this, this fall, Oregon and Alaska are going to legalize, so the entire west coast of North America, with the exception of British Columbia, will have legal marijuana. And that has very bad implications for British Columbia, because our tourists are the same tourists that Colorado appeals to in winter, yes. with Aspen and Vail, and mm -hmm. Washington appeals to the same tourists in summer. And if they have legal marijuana in those tourist destinations and British Columbia doesn't, right. that's going to influence Europeans and other mm -hmm. Americans who might normally come to British Columbia. Yeah, BC Tourism should be listening to this and taking notes, absolutely. And they are, and the money is talking. Politicians now can use that excuse that we need the money. This People are going to get marijuana anyway. Why shouldn't it go through legal channels so that we can get tax money? That's going to be the dominant political thought about marijuana for the next 10 years. Um, Mark, I have to ask you, why is this so important to you? Because you've said pretty clearly that it's not that you want to smoke marijuana. That's, it's, not, it's not for your own personal consumption that you, you want to insist on it being legalized, but it's about the principle. So what is it about the principle that you think it's worth going to jail for? Because since 1969, when marijuana arrests started really skyrocketing in Canada, we've had over 2 million Canadians charged and arrested. Their lives disturbed, potentially traumatized, and hundreds of thousands of people have gone to jail for marijuana since 1969. So for 45 years, a couple of generations, we've had this colossal injustice targeted against a very certain group of people leading this peaceful and honest lifestyle choice that somehow doesn't mesh with government policy. And I'm thinking, what's the public benefit then? If we're going to destroy 50 thousand people's opportunities by giving them criminal records every year and rounding up people decade after decade. What's the public benefit? And there is no public benefit. There is no good side to prohibition. It gives young people criminal records. It encourages gang behavior. It creates instability on the streets. Too much of our personal treasure and wealth is going to an overpriced commodity that's only that way because of prohibition. Civil rights are being violated. Police are wiretapping and spying on people. All this could be dealt with positively by legalizing marijuana and putting it in a tax and regulated environment. There is no social benefit that's positive by marijuana prohibition. And Canadians need to think, the next election is a referendum on this very right. matter. Okay, and, and your wife Jody is running for the Liberal Party in Windsor, uh, the federal Liberals. You've said if the Liberals win a majority, pot will be legalized. Justin Trudeau has already come out. He's an advocate of pot. I don't, know, I don't know how strong he wants to see it legalized, but certainly he's going to take the, uh, the public temperature. So are, are you still certain that within uh, your lifetime that Canada will be a place where pot is legal? Oh, we're going to bury marijuana prohibition next October. It's not in my lifetime. It's next year. And you're going to hear about it for the next 14 months. We're going to get one million extra voters out for the Liberal Party of Canada next election, and it's going to make the difference. Mark, you had said something uh, to the effect of uh, people are going to get it anyway, so why not legalize it? The same argument can be made about prostitution. You know, Do you think that prostitution should be legalized? Well, if you're against prostitution, what are you against? Sex or money? Because that's all it is. It's just sex and money. So to be against legal prostitution means you'd rather endanger society over something about sex or money. And sex and money are two fundamental motivations of any civilized society. Most people want sex, and some people can't get it without paying it. And I don't know why we discriminate against them. And sex is always a trade. In every relationship where sex is going on, something is being traded. It could be spiritual, it could be metaphysical, it could be property, it could be money. We're trading for sex all the time, all our lives, forever. So. Sex and money are very caught up in what civilization is, so we can't criminalize it in a moral and just society. It's absurd. Mark, we have about 20 seconds left. Tell me some of the comments you've heard from people, um, sincere comments from those who supported you uh, all that time that you were in jail for this principle. I had one person send me a letter in jail every day for four and a half years from Holland, Michigan, a fellow named Len Preslesnik, and he wrote me dutifully, a 61-year-old retired, wrote me every day for four and a half years because he believed in me. That's an incredible shyness report. Boy, it sure is. Mark Emery is known as the Prince of Pot, aspires to be the King of Pot, uh, and has uh, certainly opened a lot of eyes uh, and made a lot of people sit up and take notice. Mark, thank you. Uh, appreciate thank your you. time today. When we come back, is there something wrong with how our youngest students are taught in the classroom? You know, Liz, that's a good question because starting this September, kindergarten will never be the same. <laughs> 
There's going to be a whole new way to learn. We'll tell you all about it next.